Hello, I am back as promised with The Housekeeper's Diary. We're focusing on chapter three in this video because it's about the Christmas season. It was actually Wendy Berry's first Christmas ever at Highgrove. And it's a great behind the scenes look at what goes on, the staff party and the trees being set up and the whole vibe at Highgrove. Now, the then Prince Charles and Diana had just come back from their very successful Australian tour. Now, you would have read in a lot of books that it was actually the Australian tour and Charles's jealousy on the Australian tour that created a lot of friction between the couple and sort of was the start of the real sort of breakup between them. Well, it's not in this book. Uh, Diana is really, really excited. She's thrilled how well it went. They're getting on famously. Everyone's excited about Christmas, you know, coming. And so there's none of that. There's no suggestion that there's any big fallout between the then Prince Charles and Diana. So there was another bit of excitement because Diana and Charles had on the Tuesday evening before when this chapter opens, attended the Back to Future premiere in London. And so Diana comes into the kitchen and in the kitchen is her detective, Barry Manneke, also the chef and Mervyn, I believe his name is, and also Wendy Berry. And they had actually just finished their lunch, which was a joint of roast lamb. So Diana comes in and she's sort of hacking into this joint of roast lamb with a knife and she's taking all the juiciest, loveliest bits, you know, close to the bone. And she's sort of chatting and munching away. And so she's telling them all about this Back to Future premiere and she's really on a high, a really great high. She's in a good time of her life. And so I'm going to read you a quote and there's a reference to a bit of meat dropping on the floor. That's why I had to tell you about the roast lamb because you wouldn't have any context for that. So here we go. Here's the quote. It was such fun and so excited she giggled as a small piece of meat dropped to the floor. And there were so many photographers. I think they actually got some very good pictures of me. And then Wendy Berry says, did you see them all back here? And she goes back to one of the cupboards in the pantry and comes back with a pile of newspapers packed with photographs of the occasion. And Diana's really excited that she's got those. And she goes, ooh, let me see them. So then for the next at least an hour, Wendy Berry said they all sat around and initially it was fun because Diana was pointing out, you know, where the photographs were less than flattering and so they were having a good laugh at that. But it started to go on a bit and then they were sort of constantly comparing photographs and where she looked fabulous in and where she looked, you know, this one didn't look as good but, oh, wasn't this a good angle, and you know. And it went on and on and on. Now, of course... The detective, Barry Maddocky, who absolutely adored Diana, wouldn't sort of give her the indication that this had gone on a bit long. Wendy Berry felt like it had gone on a bit long and the chef, poor old chef Mervyn <laughs> was making noises that he had to get the next meal ready, you know, for dinner or get the afternoon tea tray ready or whatever. But it just went on a bit too long, but not for Diana. She was absolutely enthralled. Now, Wendy Berry only has good things to say about Diana's private detective, Barry Manneke. And although Diana obviously adored him and apparently flirted with him outrageously, uh, Wendy is adamant that despite all rumours, she knows, that she just believes with all her heart that there was never any affair it was more the fact that Barry Manneke felt very protective of her. He used to try to cheer her up. And when she was sobbing or crying or upset, he used to hug her because he felt sorry for her. However, he was warned off by his superior that it was getting all too friendly, that he wasn't being professional enough and that he needed to back off. But of course, Diana being the personality that she was, I don't think anyone in her employ could really back off. I think she demanded of them a lot of intimacy and a lot of emotional transparency. And I, I think she just was very, very demanding. So it ended up that Barry Manneke actually got the heave ho. He was reassigned and he went off. And a few years later, he died in a tragic, tragic traffic accident. Now, there's no suggestion that there was anything untoward about that. I know there are conspiracy theories about that and implications that he had an affair with her and that's why he was <laughs> no more. But that's not from what I can gather and from what Wendy Berry says, which I do trust her account because she's very forthright in this book. Um, no, it wasn't that at all.
Now, also in this chapter, Wendy finally receives the housekeeper's guide. And that was from Buckingham Palace. And she'd been waiting on this because evidently it would tell her exactly what she was supposed to do and lay out all her duties. Now, I'm going to share a little bit with you because, gee, she did work hard. I mean, she didn't have staff under her to do this. It was all her. She was the housekeeper that did the housekeeping, if you get what I mean. So I'll just read you a little bit of what she was expected to get done. Housekeeping in royal houses. Days when the house is empty. Hand vacuum, all soft furnishing, palmets, window seats, curtains, etc. Clean mirrors and pitchers and glass tops. Wipe woodwork, vacuum carpets and dust. Clean staff bedrooms and staff areas. Change sheets and catch up on all household laundry. <laughs> That's a lot, isn't it? Then, before anyone arrives, so this is when they're in residence, arrange flowers and plants, put out towels, open windows and draw blinds. Okay, well, that's not too hard. When a member or members of the family are in 7 a.m., thoroughly dust all downstairs areas and carpet sweep because she couldn't use the hoover before 7 a.m. Straighten magazines, empty waste paper baskets, plump cushions, draw curtains, set staff table for breakfast and clear away afterwards. Whilst their royal highnesses are at breakfast, tidy the bedrooms, make the beds, clean the bathrooms, change the towels. <gasps> I'm exhausted already. <laughs> and any time they came back into the room or anything, she would have to drop everything, go, then come back and do it when they weren't there. Check water in flowers and plants, start on nursery, beds, bathrooms, change towels, dust and vacuum, check flowers. Set staff table for lunch, clear up after lunch, and on it goes right up through till 6 p.m. So she started at 7 a.m. and this is 6 p.m. Check all downstairs rooms, guest bathrooms, studies, sitting room, bedrooms and bathrooms, empty waste paper baskets, plump pillows, straightened magazines, white basins, straightened towels. Set staff dinner table, clear away afterwards. While their royal highnesses are bathing, redo study sitting room, turn down bed. <laughs> it just goes on and on. And it's truly, truly awful. I mean, if I had a list like this, I think I would just be completely overwhelmed. I think I probably would have quit within a month. I would have been <laughs> exhausted. And of course, Charles is very particular. So he would notice if anything was wrong. He would notice if there was a light bulb that needed replacing or anything at all. Now, a few weeks went on. It was about mid-December and Charles and Diana had this huge barney. And Diana ran from the dining room up to her bedroom. Now, Wendy Berry was actually in Charles's bedroom tidying that up. And she was sort of frozen, stuck, because she could hear Diana crying, sobbing in her her bedroom but her door was still open so Wendy Berry didn't know what to do she felt the normal natural human urge to comfort her but she also knew that that might be seen as overstepping the mark because you could never be too sure you know what sort of reception you were going to get so she waited she bided her time and then she quickly snuck past Diana's door and went down the back stairs only to meet Barbara Barnes with the two boys also sneaking down the back stairs so she could take the two boys to the, their father in the dining room and when they got to the dining room Wendy Berry said the boys ran in and she saw Charles scoop them up and you know really happy to see them and he'd been in the dining room after the Barney after the huge argument for about an hour just on his own and Diana was you know wailing up in the bedroom and that's when I realized that just how much tension and how much stress all the staff must have been under I mean imagine the poor nanny trying to protect the children from all the arguing and all the big barnies and, you know. So this sort of happened about mid-December in 85. And it was actually that afternoon, it all things all calmed down, and Wendy Berry went up to speak to Diana's dresser, Faye. And unfortunately, Faye was not in a good mood because Diana, being upset, had taken it out on the dresser and ordered her to re-iron all her clothes, basically. And so the dresser really vents and complains quite bitterly 
to Wendy Berry. You know, sometimes I wonder why I took on this job at all, this is Faye the dresser, as she carefully took the creases out of her heavy skirt. I know it sounds glamorous and all that at first, but really all we are here for is to skivvy around after some very spoiled people who, if they're not crying their eyes out, are ridiculously demanding. It's not as if we're paid very much, is it? So she's going off. And then Wendy Berry actually goes, like that because she hears a noise out in the hall and she tiptoes over to Faye's door and she opens the door and she looks out and there's Diana hightailing it back up the hall in bare feet and back into her room. So Diana was listening at the keyhole and had gone barefoot so people couldn't hear her walking along the hall. Well, about half an hour after that, Faye gets a call in her room. She's to go and see the mistress. And to say she got raked over the coals would be an understatement. Wendy Berry says it was beyond belief and Faye looked really shaken after it. Now, Wendy Berry points out that it was really hypocritical of Diana because she didn't even acknowledge when she was ranting and raving at Faye for her disloyalty, she didn't even acknowledge that she'd been listening in at the keyhole on a private conversation. So evidently all the staff had to be really careful because they just didn't have any privacy. They couldn't make a joke. They couldn't talk about anyone in the household because there were ears everywhere. And it makes me wonder, I wonder whether that's why Meghan Markle loved bare feet. So then happier times <laughs> that the trees arrived and the boys got their own tree in the nursery and Wendy Berry said the staff took so much care to make Christmas really magical and memorable for the boys and evidently the nursery tree was magical and lovely and spectacular and the tree in the foyer at High Grove wasn't actually that good. Wendy Berry didn't think she thought it was, you know, not, not a lot of care was taken. It was more concentrated on the boys tree and all the staff were given 20 pounds to go and buy a Christmas gift for themselves. They had to wrap it themselves. Then it was handed in so that Diana and Charles could hand it out at the staff Christmas party. Now, the staff Christmas party was really good. There was lots of wine flowing, beautiful food. And she said that that's when everyone used to fall back in love with Charles because Charles would always give a heartfelt speech and thank everyone, you know, profusely. And everyone would go, oh, and, and sort of rededicate themselves to him because he used to inspire such loyalty. And everyone used to fall in love with Diana at these parties because she was so lovely and so friendly and made sure everyone had such a lovely time and made sure she went around to every table and talked to everyone personally and knew about their families. And so the book is always balanced with these really lovely times and there's glimpses into when they were on their best behavior and were truly lovely people. But then you've got the other side where you see that, you know, just how tense and truly dreadful it was at times. So at this point, they go back to London, then on to Sandringham to spend Christmas with the royal family. That gives all the staff a bit of a breather. They can see their own families and they can get Highgrove up to snuff for the new year. Um, so I hope you will join me again. There's a few more juicy little stories from this book I'd love to share. And I'll see you again really soon. Bye. Bye.